Today, I will be talking about Everest, the environmental story. Well, when I say the environmental story now, it's really my environmental story, how I got involved. And it addresses a lot of the issues that are on Everest. Not everything, of course. I can't put everything in a half hour presentation, but I'll do my best. I think this picture is rather redundant in this crowd. But nevertheless, I'd like to introduce you to Nepal. It sits between India and Tibet. And right there is Mount Everest, of course. And I was actually just back from university back in 2006, and I went to climb on Mount Choyu, which was the first time I went on a big mountain. And at that time, I had a really negative experience of being in the mountains. Um, what happened was, when I was at base camp, nobody really talked to each other. None of the teams talked to each other, cooperated. And everybody seemed to have this suspicious feeling towards each other. And, and nobody was sharing information, say, for example, weather or, or, uh, or their own summit plans and things like that. And I didn't like that. I thought that was kind of you know, wrong, not in the spirit of mountaineering. And I, at that time, I was just, what, 22? And I decided, hey, you know, I want to do something about this. Next time I go on a mountain, I, I'll try something out. And I, th I was racking my brains, and I thought, what, what could be an interesting thing to do? where people would come and would enjoy being in the company of others. And what I noticed up in, the, up in base camp was everybody wanted really nice bread and cakes and, and just pastries, but it wasn't available. So the next time I went to a big mountain, Mount Everest in 2007, I went to climb, but at the same time I also set up the bakery. And apparently it was the highest bakery in the world at the time. And uh, it, uh, I've been told that it made the best apple pie in the world. <laughs> It could also be the fact that people just been trekking 10 days to base camp and it just tasted good because of that. But it was at that time, that year, when I climbed Everest, that I noticed a lot of problems on the mountain, um, in particular, uh, trash. And it wasn't just trash, but there were other impacts as well, and particularly with climate change. Now, I won't go too much into the climate change aspect in this, in this talk, but Specifically with regard to trash, I thought it was a, it was a damn shame that the be most beautiful mountain in the world, at least for me, and if not the most, most famous mountain, and it, it had a really bad reputation for being also the dirtiest mountain. Now, I, as a Sherpa, as a Nepali, wanted to do something about this. But I had a big problem, which is I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in my pocket which I, to launch a cleaning expedition. But what I did see at that time was a lot of Sherpas going up on the mountain, fixing up camps, dumping all their equipment, say tents or oxygen or whatever it may be, and then coming down empty, absolutely empty. And I, th I thought that's a missed opportunity. So what I did was I started to approach all the different camps, all the, all the Sherpas and also Western mountaineers, and I said, if you guys are coming down empty and you find trash on your way, just collect it. Just put it in your backpack. Make sure you know, you're not putting yourself in danger. But, you know, if you can, put it in your backpack. Bring it to me in base camp. We'll weigh it. And then I'll give you cash for it. So at the moment, we're still doing this. And I started this scheme in 2008. We call it the cash for trash. And we've still been, we've still been doing it this year again, uh, up, up until this year. Um, and uh, it's been pretty successful. Uh, we're paying 100 rupees, which is about 1.2 um, New Zealand dollars, or just under a one US dollar per kilogram of garbage that is brought down. And the, the great thing about that is it, it's money spent that directly gets a result, rather than me spending money on putting a big team together who may or may not bring down trash. Here, we're paying directly for the trash to be brought down. And you know what? Everybody actually joined in, because you know um, most of the Sherpas there are there to make a living, to, for an income. And this was, for them, an added opportunity to make a little bit extra on the side when they're coming down anyways. I mean, if they're superhuman going up, can you imagine what they're like coming down? So it was really very little effort for them to do this. And very quickly, we had a lot of people join in. At the same time, it wasn't just enough to talk about the trash, to deal with the trash. For me, I had a really nasty experience in 2007, the first time I went there. Um, Rudy, who was an Austrian climber, and myself, we were sharing a tent uh, at Camp 2. 
And where we put, the, put up our tent, it was a, a pretty cool spot. It was really nice. We had a nice view and so on. And after a, a week or two, I think a couple of weeks later, it started to smell really bad in the tent. As it got hotter during the, as the season went on, it got hotter. The ice started to melt around us. We realized that we had camped right on the spot of an old toilet site. And that was pretty nasty. And so um, on my trip to Golden, Colorado, and um, to the American Alpine Club at the time, I talked about my intention to do, uh, uh, call it an environmental expedition, and to address these issues. And I was very lucky to, to bump into um, Roger Robinson, who then offered, offered the use of the clean mountain cans. And we had a bunch of clean mountain cans shipped from the United States to Nepal. And also, use, with the clean mountain can, we've been using um, a product called Restop, which is also available here. I know Lou is here. I just met him there. Um, but not just that, we could, you, could use, you could call them wag bags, toilet bags. And what we started to do was we used these clean mountain cans at Camp 2. We used them as a toilet seat. And we would put the, the, the toilet bags over them. But we would give each climber their own toilet bag before they left base camp. And we would put their names on the bag with a permanent marker. So they couldn't use it and just hide it away somewhere. We would quickly find out who's been hiding their toilet bags away. And that's become quite successful. It's not 100% because some, some people are still quite, quite sneaky. But one great thing is when we did have a problem with carrying our uh, poo down, um, and there were two. First of all, there was my own um, apprehension at introducing the system to the Sherpas to say, hey, can you bring your poo down because of the cultural norms. But it was very, very quick. In this, in this exact uh, meeting here, uh, one of my Sherpas, Pasang, said it very clearly. Before, we were carrying it here. Now we are carrying it here. So it's not a big deal. And that was great. Now, and the second problem for me was the fact that there were, in fact, some climbers who were hiding their toilet bags away. And that was, that was not very pleasant for, for us as the team. But you know what? That's where the clean mountain can came in very handy because we could just dump all the, all the um, hidden bags in the clean mountain can, seal it up, and bring it down. So it, it was a great success, and we continue to use it. And I've also noticed in recent years that other teams also are using the, clean, the, the um, toilet bags and um, uh, products similar to clean, the clean mountain can on Everest. So um, I, I would like to say that it, it has been catching on. Um, and I hope it continues to do so, but I don't think that's enough. In my opinion, we need to go further. And um, together with my father, um, who is currently the president of the Nepal Mountaineering Association, we have been uh, lobbying the government to make it mandatory that all teams use um, toilet bags. But uh, it's always very difficult to work with the government. They're not always very responsive, and sometimes they don't understand the issues. During that time, we also introduced using solar cookers at Mount Everest, uh, at Everest Base Camp. And this is a very simple contraption. It's like an inverted, um, inverted magnifying glass. So everything, this big disk here, reflects all the light onto that pot, and it boils the pot. And that was really quite a eureka moment for us when that worked well. Um, we put a pot of, of nine liters in the middle of this thing, and in 35 minutes, it boils at base camp. So very, well, free, free fuel for us, really. And um, in the past, you know, uh, mountaineers have a reputation of being smelly and stinky. Well, not in my camp, because my camp has hot water all the time. And you see people, um, you see people um, ready to take showers at any time. But of course, I recommend it only during the day. Uh, in the sun, because obviously it's warm, so you don't want to catch a cold. And besides, that solar cooker wouldn't work if there was no sun. And finally, just uh, about the climate change again, uh, we've been, uh, together with Appa Sherpa, who's in this picture here, uh, we've been trying to raise awareness about climate change and the impacts of climate change in Nepal Himalayas, well, throughout the Himalayas, but in particular in Nepal. And in fact, we've been taking up the message, stop climate change, let the Himalayas live, to the summit of Everest. And in this particular time, I think it was Appa's 19th time on the summit of Mount Everest. He's the world record holder. He continues to be the world record holder to this day. And 
every time he broke his own record of being on, on the top, news and media always wanted to cover that, and they would ask for a picture. So we would send them this picture. Um, and following up from, from our expeditions on Everest, actually, Appa and myself also walked right across Nepal uh, in 99 days, uh, visiting all the different villages uh, and looking at the climate change impacts throughout Nepal, not just in the mountains. Uh, but that's a story for another time, I think. And this is a letter I got this year from the SBCC, who are the NGO that is responsible for cleaning Mount Everest. And um, I'm very proud to say that uh, until today, we have cleaned up more than 15,700 kilograms of garbage off of Mount Everest, and God knows how much uh, human waste off of it. This little rock here is from the top of Mount Everest. And this was, a this was a campaign we launched, Climate for Life, together with APA uh, and with the World Wildlife Fund. And this was just before the, the COP, um, COP15 in uh, Denmark. And the, the, the gentleman to my left here is the former prime minister of Nepal. And what we wanted to do was show that the mountain is literally melting and the rocks are coming out on the top of Everest. And this actually is a, a rock from the top of Everest. And um, we'd handed uh, a number of these out to the, uh, the prime minister in the hope that he would take them to the world leaders at the COP15 uh, meeting. And uh, he said that he had done so. And this is a picture of him with Obama. Uh, apparently, he, at this meeting, he presented the rock of Everest to him. So hopefully, you know, that is a nice memento on his mantelpiece at the moment. And he re reflects on it and says, we need to do something about climate change. On to another pro uh, problem now. Overcrowding on Everest has been a big issue, and, and a lot of people talk about this. This particular picture is from 2012, um, and I think this is a rather unfortunate picture, to be honest, because it was a, a rather exceptional year. Um, basically, what had happened in a, in a nutshell was the, the rope fixing team got delayed because of an accident, and all the, the, the rope fixing activities got shifted late into the season, and people started to panic. And everybody, once the rope was fixed to the summit of Everest, everybody went on the same day to the top. And hence, you had a picture of uh, 200 Sherpas hanging on a single rope. Now, this is not a picture that anybody likes to see. But then there's a bigger question to be asked. Where, what, was, what were the other places on Mount Everest like? And they were empty, because I was there. It was only, overcrowding is only when there are a lot of people at the same place at the same time. So this is not something that anybody wants to see. And so to mitigate this, the, the government of Nepal um, asked the expedition operators of Nepal to look into the problem. And I'm again, I'm part of the expedition operators of Nepal. And one of the main issues that we tackled right away was the rope issue. And it's not just about, um, about crowding and so on. The rope issue is also a, a, an environmental problem because in the past there would be dozens of ropes hanging from from any particular uh, place. Now this here is the Hillary Step, and who can guess which is the newest rope? Now if you're hanging on one of these ropes, guessing this is the newest one, and you arrive to an anchor point like this, that's pretty scary, right? So that's the first thing that we did to address the, the rope fixing, uh, the rope issue. And one of the great things that has happened is that everybody, all the expedition operators, uh, have pulled together and actually started working because we, everybody has the same goal, to get to the top uh, and get, sa get there safely and back safely. And through the Expedition Operators Association as, um, as a facilitator and all the different expedition operators working together to bring in gear and all uh, all a homogenous set, as well as rope, all the same color, we started to tackle the problem of, of actually um, bad rope on the mountain. And so, for, for example, in this particular year, we had all black rope. So everybody was told, climb only on the back black rope. They're anchored to the, the newest uh, anchors, and you're going to be safe. And the, when the rope fixing team went up there, they put up the new rope, took down the old rope, and the place has gotten a lot safer. At the same time, we also started to talk amongst ourselves. And like I said, the biggest problem with crowding is when there are too many people at the same place at the same time. So um, in this particular meeting, 
although this is a, a rope fixing meeting here, we were, uh, we were meeting with different teams um, and asking everybody, when are you planning to go up? And some would say on the 22nd, some would say on the 23rd, some would say 24th, some would say my weather is saying later, 27th, whatever it may be. And we would go around camp, or we would meet at a meeting like this, and we would note down everybody's uh, expected summit dates, and then calculate. And whenever there were a lot of people on the same particular date, we would call around to the people who were going on that date and say, hey, listen, there's about 250 people planning to go for the summit that day. Can anybody hold back a couple of days? And overwhelmingly, the response was yes, because nobody wants to climb in a crowd. Nobody wants to run the risk of running uh, out of oxygen, you know. So everybody is very keen to shift their schedule so that this crowding issue would, would not affect their own particular climb. So it's not ideal, but what we, with what we have in Nepal at the moment, it's, it seems to be working. But there are, of course, bigger questions about how do we... Uh, how do we regulate the type of climbers that come to Nepal? But until there are clear regulations from the government about putting restrictions in, it's, we are still going to be facing these problems with a lot of people coming to Nepal to climb, and we're going to have to manage it. Um, so far, it's been okay. Fingers crossed, it'll stay okay. But nevertheless, we are still working on different regulations. Uh, and one of the regulations that we've proposed is that climbers should, be, um, should have a track record of climbing big mountains before coming to Everest. Um, also, and more controversially, uh, we have also noticed um, that climbers who are actually unassisted have a bigger risk of running into danger, uh, have a bigger risk of getting into accidents or into tricky situations where they will then require um, people, other teams to come in and rescue them. So, Controversially, um, there is a proposal in that every team, uh, every team should have, um, sorry, every cl uh, climber on the permit should have a corresponding Sherpa to climb with him or a guide, uh, a certified guide climbing with him on a 7,000 meter mountain, uh, on, sorry, on an 8,000 meter mountain, every two climbers should have one Sherpa uh, on a 7,000 meter mountain, I believe it's three to one, um, oh, sorry, one to a team. So. Uh, these are some of the, regula uh, the, the proposed regulations. It's not gone through, but the government is mulling it over. In recent times, we've also uh, been getting uh, reports in the media, I'm sure you might have read it, that the government is mulling over new ideas about um, restricting uh, disabled climbers uh, and so on. Uh, I am, to be honest, personally, I am uh, against this. I do not think disability is a reason to bar somebody from the mountain. I, there are plenty of disabled climbers who are better climbers than I am or are than many people in this room. And I think that is that, that would constitute discrimination. And that's what my opinion is. I've, I've been putting this forward. But surely um, there should be a way of um, um, testing, or rather, sorry, um, uh, screening uh, climbers on the mountain. But in Nepal, we do have a problem. If we introduce any new regulations and they are very restrictive, the simple answer for climbers is we're just going to go climb on the China side. So Nepal does have its hands tied a little bit in that if it wants to introduce new regulation, it needs to work with China. And it's not always possible to do so. But an example of where it has worked is when uh, a 13-year-old young American climbed and became the youngest American to climb Mount Everest. There was a media uproar. Uh, and the Chinese got wind of this. Um, and they don't like bad publicity, as you and I all know. And very quickly, the Chinese drafted a, a new regulation of minimum age. And that was then um, uh, communicated to the Nepal government and said, listen, we need to do this. And the Nepal government went through with it. So things can happen very quickly. And the media does have a big uh, part to play in this, uh, as, as do gatherings like ours, where we have a big say in how mountains are run. So I keep on uh, um, bashing this point that um, we need uh, to communicate with the government of Nepal, whether it's through the media, whether it's talking directly to the ministers, however it may be from our own different positions, we need to keep talking to the government of Nepal that they put in good regulations so that the future of mountaineering stays um, good in Nepal. There was another proposal uh, that the government um, asked the uh, 
Expedition Operators Association to look into. And that was, what would happen if we put a ladder on the Hillary step? We looked into it. It is a possibility to put a ladder in the Hillary step. And of course, a lot of people don't like this idea. But the thing is, in the 1960s, the Chinese already put a ladder on the second step. And many, of, many people don't actually know that, but there, there actually is already a ladder high up on the mountain on Everest, but on the China side. And Nepal was looking at the same idea, and we're looking at putting a ladder down here to come around. So basically, one of the big bottlenecks on Everest is the Hillary Step, where people would uh, be going up and coming down at the same time, and that caused a huge problem. Now, unfortunately, um, this has now become a redundant argument because the latest report from this year is that the Hillary Step is gone after the earthquake. This year, our climbers came back and said these boulders here have fallen down and that it's not so much of a step but more of a ramp now and it's much easier to pass. This is not, not really that great news, to be honest, so I'm sorry to be breaking that news to you now. Um, but then now the question of the future. What about the future for Everest? How do we go, go further? Now, on this particular point, I think I, I need to make you aware that there's a road coming to Lukla, to the Everest region. And this road is going to be there in the next five years. It's a, it's a national plan, and every government says it's a priority project. So a priority project normally takes a long time anyways, but um, it will be there sooner or later. And the question is, how is that going to impact Mount Everest and the Everest region in general? And our suspicion, when I say ours, the community, um, the Sherpas of the region, is going to have a huge impact. Because first of all, there's not going to be any seasonality anymore. Everybody wants to go to Everest. Most people that come to Nepal want to go to Everest at least once. And when you don't have the seasons in the way, you're going to have people being able to go to Everest any time of year. Not only that, it brings down the cost of travel to go to Everest. So now instead of $360 for a flight to Lukland back, you could probably get there in about 1,800 to 2,000 rupees, which would be about $20 if you took a bus there. So that means that people who were previously not able to afford to go to Everest can now do so. Like I said yesterday in, in the talk, people spend more on the flight to Nepal than they do in Nepal. Now, with the type of people, the call them backpackers or, or, or um, low-spending uh, tourists. They're going to the Annapurna region predominantly at, at the moment, but the moment that road comes in, they're going to be able to go to Nepal on a budget, on a shoestring budget, uh, sorry, go to Everest on a shoestring budget, and that means that numbers are going to boom. And right now we're, we're just about 38,000 trekkers a year in the Everest region, and that number could go tenfold, goodness knows. Right. We are actually in the process right now of doing an impact assessment. So through an association, uh, an organization that I'm involved in called the Climate Alliance for Himalayan Communities, we're just in talks with um, an organization called Frost and Sullivan, who are um, going to, we're just about to sign an MOU, uh, and we're going to start raising funds for doing an impact assessment of this road in, that's going to Mount Everest. And what's going to be the social impact? what's going to be the environmental impact, what's going to be the economic impact. And um, hopefully we'll have this um, assessment before the road actually gets to Lukla. That's one of the good things in Nepal, that everything's so slow. So maybe we could get that done before the road gets there and prepare for the negative impacts and encourage the, the more positive ones. But at this moment, that is still up in the air. And uh, I hope that in, a, in the next uh, sustainable summits, uh, if I get invited to talk again, I'll be able to share some good news. For now, thank you very much for listening.